Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. This is Jim Pickett with Irma. Thank you for joining us on this call, this, uh, whatever time of day it is for you. We are still dialing out a few folks. If you just give us a minute or so, we will get started shortly. And while we're dialing in these last folks, if our presenters can please shoot me a note or say something in the chat to let me know you are ready. So that's Craig, Jose, and Kenneth. Hello to folks who are just logging in and dialing in. This is Jim Pickett with Irma. We're about to start our uh, teleconference in just a moment. Thanks for your patience. Just dialing in a few last folks. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here. You are you have dialed in and or logged into We're on our way, moving forward on the rectal road, new drugs, formulations, and modes of delivery. We're really excited about this call today. Uh, very thankful to AVAC and their team for supporting this call with Irma. We have three great presenters. Um, we'll be starting with Dr. Craig Hendricks, moving on to Dr. Jose Bauermeister, and concluding with Kenneth Palmer. The way this will work is we will um, take uh, brief clarifying questions after each presentation, uh, mostly through the chat. Uh, you can, so you can leave questions in the chat. You can also uh, ask questions verbally. We will be uh, allowing for verbal questions at the end of the call. At the moment, everyone is on global mute, and we are doing that so we can have a nice, clean recording for the call, which we will be posting online later. Um, when it is time to, uh, to speak uh, verbally and you want to unmute your line, um, you will press star 7 to unmute your phone at that time. When you are done speaking, please press star 6 to mute your phone again. Uh, again, this is really just for um, a nice, clean recording that we can have online and people can enjoy the webinar without lots of crazy distractions in the background. So I think without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. If uh, we can have Craig Hendricks unmute his phone and uh, take us through his slides. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thanks, Great. Craig. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for being on. So the last time uh, we had a seminar, we talked about sort of the path so far where we talked a lot about uh, tenofovir and development in a couple of different uh, dosing forms. Uh, today I'm going to give an overview of uh, some very exciting projects that are, have just started or are about to start 
so we can see where we're heading. Uh, there's, a, I'll mention, probably seven or eight studies um, just to give you a taste for the variety of drugs and different formulations that are uh, going to be studied in the next uh, 12, 24 months. Um, and then there will be much more detail on a couple studies in particular uh, from, the, from the other speakers. And I'll, so I'll go very light on details just to sort of introduce those. Uh, next slide, please. So I think most of the folks online are probably aware of the need for rectal microbicides. It's, it's clear that oral PrEP is not for everyone. In fact, in some, in some uh, surveys, as many as uh, uh, a quarter or more of participants are saying their least favorite form of dosing is oral PrEP. Um, prevention options, if we had a variety of them, are expected to improve adherence overall in those that are taking some sort of formulation to prevent HIV infection. This has certainly been the experience in contraceptive development where a variety of dosage forms has provided um, different options for different folks with different needs to select a product that can improve their adherence to contraception. We hope to see the same thing with HIV prevention. There's clearly a desire for products that can be used just around the time of sex, and I'll refer to these as on-demand products. In addition, there's a desire for products that conform to uh, commonly practiced anal sex behaviors, for example, medicating a lube or medicating a douche. And I'll refer to these as behaviorally congruent strategies. And this would be rather than using an applicator to deliver a gel, which is anything but a typical uh, process <coughs> for uh, most individuals prior to uh, anal sex. Next slide, please. And I also think that the, there's plenty of data suggesting rectal microbicides are feasible and probably feasible with very high efficacy. Uh, there is very strong data for on-demand use of, of oral PrEP, Truvada, where efficacy is very high. In Ipergay, there was an 86% relative risk reduction. There's also evidence, at least for modest efficacy, with on-demand vaginal tenofovir products. In several studies, there was about a 60% relative risk reduction when adherence was, um, was good, although not perfect. There's a number of animal models that show that rectal tenofovir protects from anal monkey HIV in challenge studies. And then behaviorally congruent formulations which piggyback onto common sexual practices uh, may potentially, uh, certainly they're expected to, improve uptake and adherence to uh, rectal microbicide formulations. Next slide, please. So this leaves us with a couple of very clear gaps in knowledge that, we're, that we need to explore. The questions are, will it lube, a douche, a suppository, or an insert, or a tablet that you'll hear more about? Will these be capable of delivering enough drug to the rectum to prevent HIV infection? And will these products be acceptable for use before anal sex? Can any drug protect both the rectum and the vagina with a single dose to either the rectum or the vagina? Do single doses before sex deliver enough drug? That is, does on-demand work for topical rectal microbicide for HIV prevention? And does any product protect from other sexually transmitted infections as well as HIV? That is, is there a product that could be a multi-purpose um, technology? To address these key questions, next slide, we move on down the rectal road as our journey continues. I will talk about seven different drugs, four different formulations, all being tested as rectal microbicides in eight studies over the next uh, year or two. Five of these are within the MTN, the Microbicide Trial Network, where these studies are being developed, and two are expected to launch a little bit later this year. Three of the studies I'll mention are part of program project grant studies that are ongoing or in development and all of the studies that I'll mention here are funded by the NIH. So a big shout out, thank you to the NIH for funding these studies, uh, which I think has largely been in response to interest from the community, working with the scientists to put these things together. Next slide. So the studies, MTN026. This is a phase one study, rectal uh, gel study, or safety, acceptability, and both pharmacokinetics, which is drug concentration over time, and pharmacodynamics, which is um, concentration response kind of data, that is, what does, the, what does the drug do to the virus? This is evaluating a 0.05% dipiverine gel. Now, dipiverine is a drug that is proven to be effective in an intravaginal ring formulation. Here we'll be looking at this as a rectal gel. Um, uh, the 
folks to be enrolled in the study are both men and women, both cis and transgender. 27 uh, is the total planned. Clinical sites will be University of Pittsburgh and the uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham. And you see a simple schematic of the, of the study design at the bottom where uh, the green dots are screening and enrollment, and then the blue dot shows a single uh, application of the rectal depivirine gel, and then three days of uh, sampling to look at pharmacokinetics and uh, safety, acceptability, and pharmacodynamics. Then there's a washout period, and then there's seven directly observed doses of the gel. This is to get to steady state levels as the drug begins to accumulate in, in tissue and then the same um, type of sampling for the observations, and then follow-up. Next slide, please. MTN-033 study uh, will be very helpful to understand the feasibility of dosing uh, a microbicide uh, as a medicated lubricant. This is a phase one evaluation of the same depivirine gel that will be studied in 026. So 026 will be an important complementary study to 033. This will compare the application of gel applied as a sexual lubricant using uh, artificial phallus or dildo and simulated anal sex, that will be compared to applying the same gel using an applicator, the same kind of applicator that's been used in some of the vaginal dosing studies. The enrolled participants will be men that have sex with men and transgender women, and the primary outcomes will be to measure the distribution of the drug in colon tissue by looking at biopsies taken at different time periods after the dosing of the drug. Here we want to be sure that uh, we understand the relative concentration, that is how much of the drug gets in with an applicator, uh, does the same amount get in when you apply the drug as a sexual lubricant, because we want to be sure we can deliver enough drug by this means. So this will be an important study evaluating uh, a medicated lube. Next slide, please. In MTN-035, a study about which you'll hear much more from Jose Bauermeister, uh, the, the primary questions have to do with acceptability, tolerability, and adherence. There are no active ingredients in the products to be studied in this study. Those products will be a placebo enema or douche, a rectal insert, which is a fast-dissolving tablet, and a suppository. This study will enroll uh, men that have sex with men and transgender women and uh, probably men as well. And the design for this study is under development, and as I mentioned, Jose will provide details later in this webinar. Next slide, please. MTN037 is a study which is really a combination of active agents. The, the heavy lifting is being done by MIV-150, which is an antiretroviral drug. Carrageenan is important in possibly in the luminal activity, that is the activity of the gel within the rectum to prevent attachment of virus to, the, to mucosal cells and then penetration. And then zinc also has its own antiviral activity. So this is a gel that has activity, at least in the laboratory and in animal studies, against HIV, herpes simplex virus, and human papillomavirus. So this is a multi-purpose uh, technology active against HIV and other S S sexually transmitted infections. This study will be enrolling men and women, both cis and transgender, with a total size of 24. And the study's design is, is that this is, you get a, the participants would get a single dose of the gel, and then it is escalated to three different volumes of gel, so effectively getting um, uh, almost a tenfold increase in drug, constant, in drug dosing from the first dose, first single dose, to a second dose, and then to a third dose. And the primary readouts are um, safety, acceptability, drug concentration, and then tissue protection. Here, this is tissue that we, where we do biopsies, and we challenge the biopsies outside of the body to see if they're less susceptible to HIV infection. Next slide. MTN-039 is a phase one study of a rectal insert, and you can see uh, an example of the rectal insert to be used in, um, in this study, and that's in, in the photo. You see the white, almost bullet-shaped uh, white uh, tablet. Uh, the FDA prefers us to call these inserts, and we're looking for perhaps a better name for this. But in this case, the act, there's an active ingredient. The active ingredient will be L-vitegravir, which is an integrase strand transfer inhibitor that's already licensed for HIV treatment. And here the evaluation is to look primarily at the safety, acceptability, drug tissue concentrations of L-vitegravir, and then to look at tissue biopsies that are removed from the colon that are then challenged with HIV to see if the L-vitegravir reduces the susceptibility of colon tissue to infections outside the body, that is ex vivo. This is a collaboration with Conrad, 
This will enroll men and women, both cis and transgender, the total sample size of 20. And this will be a single dose study, although there will be a series of two doses, um, first with one tablet and the second with two tablets, so we can assess dose proportionality between these two different dose, doses. Next slide. So that concludes the MTN studies that I'm going to summarize, though Jose will tell you more about MTN 035. The next are three studies that are done as part of um, a, program, grant program, a project grant program also funded by the Division of AIDS. The first is DREAM, which is developing a rectal enema as a microbicide. And this is developing an on-demand rectal douche or enema as a behaviorally congruent microbicide. In the first study, in a series of three studies to be done in the DREAM program, DREAM01 is a clinical study, which is a single ascending dose study. Each of 16 participants will receive a series of uh, three enemas at gradually increasing doses. Excuse me, there are 18 participants. They're gradually increasing doses. Um, and we've, so far we have dosed and have data for the first um, six participants in the study at the first dose level. The, um, the questions re are related to safety, acceptability, drug concentration, and susceptibility of colon biopsies to infection, very similar to the previous studies. This is being done at the Univers uh, University of California, Los Angeles, University of Pittsburgh, and at Johns Hopkins University, uh, my own institution. There's actually some preliminary data in this that I, I can show you here. This was presented at the Paris meeting uh, about a month ago. Uh, on the y-axis, you see um, this is the intracellular tenofovir diphosphate concentration in cells that were removed from colon tissue biopsies. So these are cells that are, that are in the colon that we have removed from the biopsies ex vivo. Uh, the first couple of bars in this box plot as you move across the x-axis are the results from oral dosing of tenofovir, just a single dose. And what you see is, for the most part, the dots here at um, half an hour, 24 hours, and 72 hours are at or below these three horizontal bars. The top bar is seven days of dosing, uh, what kind of tissue concentration we would achieve, uh, which is what you would see in IPREX. Uh, there was a study demonstrating the protect, protection from, with oral uh, Truvada. The middle bar is about equivalent to four days of dosing, and the lower red bar is equivalent to about two days of dosing within a week. Uh, then as you move over to the right, you see one dose of tenofovir gel, and the concentrations, depending on time, are in what we believe to be the protective range identified by those horizontal bands. But at 72 hours, the concentrations fall off. The next set of, um, of um, data are half an hour, 24 hours, and 72 hours after a whole week of dosing of tenofovir gel with a formulation that was a bit different than, uh, um, that can be different or similar to the the gel that was used in the vaginal studies. And here you see the concentrations in the first day are consistently above those IPREX target concentrations. The very final data where you see a series of red asterisks under DREAM01, that's the data from the lowest dose to be studied in the DREAM series. And there you see the concentrations in three hours and at 24 hours are fairly consistently above the targets. In fact, they are in some cases above a whole week of dosing with the tenofovir gel. So we think we're off to a good start here with this DREAM program, achieving concentrations in excess of what we wanted to uh, compared to, um, compared to IPREX. Next slide, please. The IMQUEST program is another of these U19 um, rectal microbicide programs. This is looking at a single product that possibly could be dosed both rectally or vaginally. And one of our questions is to see if we apply the drug rectally, can we achieve vaginal concentrations that we believe will provide a degree of protection? So that's, again, one of the questions. We don't know this yet. The active ingredient is IQP0528, uh, which is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. The first clinical study is open for enrollment. This is at a single center here at Johns Hopkins. This is a first in human study. This drug has not been given to humans before. It's a phase one single rectal dose study, eight men, eight women. Uh, we're looking at safety, drug concentrations, and susceptibility of tissue to infections, that is, tissue susceptibility outside the body, and acceptability. And we're now enrolling, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. And this is a program, the PREVENT program, that uh, Kenneth Palmer will talk in more detail about later in the webinar. This, this is a, the development of Griffithson as a rectal microbicide. Griffithson also is one of these uh, products that has activity against multiple pathogens. Here you see against HIV, herpes simplex, and hepatitis C virus. 
They're studying um, macaques very actively now, and ongoing studies. And the phase one program is uh, scheduled uh, to begin at the University of Pittsburgh, scheduled for uh, the next year. Next slide, please. So what I'm showing here is uh, I'm trying to combine a couple of things. One is uh, you see along the left side the column of active drugs. So there still are seven active drugs that are under consideration for development as rectal microbicides at some stage. And then as you move across the columns, you see different dosage forms, gel with an applicator, gel as a lubricant, a douche, an insert or fast dissolving tablet, and a suppository. And what you see is these MTN studies that I just described are helping to fill out this matrix. And what we may find is that one drug has superior pharmacokinetics, that is good tissue concentrations, and it looks like it protects tissue from infection, but we may not be studying it in the optimal dosing form. So a combination of different drugs and different formulations will actually give us a lot more information so that we can imagine at least what populating this whole grid might actually look like. So we consider the best drug and the best formulation to take forward into phase two safety and then hopefully into phase three randomized controlled trials on the way to licensure. All of these studies will be completed uh, in the next couple of years and certainly all of these will be done by first quarter 2020. Uh, the red box shows which is the large box that encompasses pretty much everything, is looking at on-demand strategies. A number of these, the gel as lube and the gel as douche, are looking at behaviorally congruent strategies. There are multi-purpose sexually transmitted infection technologies in the lower left corner, and one of the products is being looked at very specifically for both rectal and vaginal use with questions about if you apply it rectally, does enough get forward into the vagina to provide protection there as well with a single dose. So lots of things we'll be learning about in the next couple of years. Next slide, please. So in the final slide, I just wanted to conclude to say that the rectal microbicide promise is based on demonstrated enough of your success based in on-demand IPERGAE, vaginal microbicide efficacy studies, and a number of animal studies showing high levels of protection. The community remains supportive of rectal microbicides, and there is a clear desire for on-demand microbi rectal microbicides, preferably in a formulation already used before anal sex, so-called behaviorally congruent, so that we're not changing behaviors so much as we're changing products. In response, there are now eight rectal microbicide studies actively enrolling or in the planning phases for start in the next year or so. Seven drugs, four formulations, and the idea is to provide options to select the best candidate for further safety and efficacy testing to completed, be completed in the next couple of years. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll pass it back to Jim at this point. Thank you so much, Craig, for an excellent presentation. I have a couple of quick uh, follow-up questions. There's a third question regarding um, 035 and who it's recruiting, and I'm going to save that question for after Jose's talk, since Jose will be spending a lot of time on 035. So, Craig, for you, if you could answer quickly. Um, both of these are about the suppository and the insert. So regarding the rectal suppository, might that also provide some minimal lubrication? And then can you quickly describe what is the, how is it different? How is the rectal insert different from a suppository? So, the, so yes, first the suppository, uh, typically the commercial suppositories, and there's a number of drugs that are dosed this way, they all include their own lubricant, which eases the insertion. I think the... Um, and we'll just have to see if this is, uh, and Jose will talk a little bit more about this in terms of the behavioral aspects and how it's seen as acceptable compared to the insert, the douche, and, um, and, and other formulations. So the comparison of the insert, the insert is a, is a rigid tablet that is much smaller typically than suppositories. It likely requires a lubricant, and we've re very recently learned that it's, it's compatible with, with, a, with what we also believe to be a healthy, a safe lubricant. Um, to ease the insertion. And once it's inserted, it dissolves um, over minutes to an hour or so. And that, in fact, is one of the questions of the study that Jose will also talk about. Uh, he will be looking at a placebo insert, and then in 039, we will be looking at an l vitegravir insert. Um, so I think the strategy is similar, just the one is a harder dosage form and smaller, uh, but both of them are applied um, via the rectum, but one of them comes with its own lubricant typically. The other probably needs to have um, a lubricant added so that it can be easily, easily be dosed. But those are the kinds of things to understand the relative desirability of either of those products uh, in the study that Jose will talk about. 
Thank you so much, Craig. And that is an excellent segue to our next talk. So without further ado, let's bring out Jose Bauermeister, who is going to be talking about building and testing rectal microbicide products, creating a new era of rectal microbicide research and development. Thank you, Jose. And make sure to unmute your phone. And Jose, if you're talking, we don't hear you. You need to star seven to unmute your phone. There we go. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, thank you. I was uh, muting myself over and over again with star six. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Early in the morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I am excited to talk about the behavioral components of how do we start building uh, rectal microbicides that align better with um, our lives and our communities. Uh, next slide, please. So I am a member of the Microbicide Trials Network Behavioral Research Working Group, and um, our job is to think from hypothetical to reality. Um, and I, I was extremely humbled when I saw this AVAC um, blog several years ago um, where a participant talked about FACTS 001 um, and one of the big questions that, that in some ways has haunted me since was, you know, why are studies not designed to fit the lives of people instead, you know, and why do we keep expecting people to fit into research? Um, and so we have, um, we have been really taking this information um, across the network very, very seriously and as a member of the BRWG, my job is to start thinking about how do we make them behaviorally congruent? How do we make products that are acceptable and that um, folks will want to use and will be competitive to the market? And I'll show you a couple of examples of that today. Next slide. So um, one of my colleagues, Al Liu, um, was kind enough to, to let me share this uh, scorecard around modality. So there are different formulations and uh, vehicles of delivery that are currently being thought of and or have been found to be uh, have efficacy. Um, so in the, the first column is the efficacy, and we know that oral prep and the vaginal ring um, have demonstrated um, efficacy against HIV. Uh, On-demand prep, also a good, good signal in that regard. But beyond the uh, efficacy component, there are other issues that participants talk to us over and over again, and we need to start thinking about them a little bit better. Um, how easy is it to use? Is it affordable? Are there side effects? Can I change my mind? Um, and we think of that reversibility, you know, reversibility as a clinical indicator. Um, what are the risks for resistance? Um, can I actually use a product that will improve my sexual pleasure? Um, and is it multi-purpose, similar to what Craig had said? So can it prevent pregnancy and or STIs? Next slide. And so um, building on, on uh, Craig's argument, I, you know, I think we can learn a lot from the family planning literature, and we know that choice matters, and um, choice matters for everyone. And so uh, when we started thinking about the scale-up of PrEP, um, it's become very, very quick to know that, um, and to recognize that PrEP may not be accessible, available, or desired among different populations, um, and that can be due to um, problems about availability or cost, as I mentioned, but it could also have to do with adherence. Um, there are there are people who have a really hard time remembering all sorts of things, and taking a pill daily is is just one of a larger set of complicated decisions that we do on a day to day basis. Um, and so, in, when I when I think of um, rectal microbicides, I don't com I don't put rectal microbicides to compete against prep. I think of them as working together. So it doesn't have to be an either or. It can really be an and. Um, and I think about topical microbicides as a way of providing on-demand prophylaxis among uh, some communities who may be vulnerable and who may not have access to PrEP, but also who may experience risk seasonally. Um, and so thinking about how do we build things that, that fit into people's lives is really what I've been spending a lot of my time over the past few years. Next slide, please. Um, so. One of the um, interesting reflections that I've, that I've had as a member of the BRWG is that the network really does value community input and participant input. And so most of the rectal microbicide safety studies um, that have existed and the ones that will, that will move forward that Craig noted and that I'll go through a little bit today um, do include behavioral assessments. We want to understand 
uh, people. We want to understand what they like, what they didn't like, what troubles they had, um, suggestions on how we could make things better. And so it's a, it's a good way within a study to, to get feedback from participants. That being said, I am always looking for community input. And so if you have a great idea or a suggestion, always feel free to send me or any of my behavioral research working groups an email. Um, and we can um, think about that as we, we move science forward. Um, now, there's always been this challenge, right? We, we, we have to conduct clinical trials for safety, um, and that inc including PK and PD. Um, and the expectation has always been that if we build it, they will come. And therefore, um, we, just, we just have to make sure that they're using the product instead of thinking about, well, how, how else can we make the product easier for people in a way to promote adherence? And so we have started thinking about moving away from these plug-and-play interventions, these one-size-fits-all, to really start getting some more additional information about how do different products um, encourage use in different ways, and therefore, do we also need to think behave of different behavioral strategies for each one so that we can meet people where they are at? Next slide. And so, in most of our studies, we um, we tend to ask these four major questions: um, Do participants know about the product when they enroll in the study? Um, did they use the study as requested by the protocol? Um, and then, if so, um, what predicted their adherence? And when we think about also their future use, if this became available, are there things we could do? And if they didn't use the product in certain contexts or settings, what predicted that so that we can learn from it and, and move the agenda forward? Next slide, please. And so, um, as often as the case, um, the science and, and marketing um, don't always go hand in hand in clinical trials, but we've been trying to, to change that. And um, I was in a meeting once where somebody was talking about this marketing um, research and development strategy called the Cherchez Le Creneau, which I actually found um, quite appropriate for the rectal microbicide agenda since the translation is uh, searching for the whole. Um, and so they, they had this really great distinction about um, understanding that if you just build a product in isolation and you give it to someone, you actually are um, not necessarily going to get a lot of traction. You're ignoring that people already have products that they use, and, and that can be considered competition. You may highlight benefits, but actually not um, realize that um, people may have competing demands, and therefore you may expect high adoption and adherence, but that may not play out in real life. And so instead, um, they argued that science should be using more of a positioning approach. We should be understanding our participants and our communities. What do they value? What kind of product fits into their day-to-day -day life? Um, how do we understand the products we're building um, in light of things that already exist in the market? So if we're building a gel, um, is the gel as good or if not better than a, a lubricant that is available um, in the market? Um, how can we use some of that marketing language to help people understand what we're building in a way that perhaps is more um, sexy and appealing to participate in a trial than the word insert or the word rectal microbicide? And then as we learn things, are there ways for us to start crafting be better behavioral interventions to promote adherence using those lessons learned? Um, so that really goes to that, the point that uh, Craig made about being behaviorally congruent. Next slide, please. And so um, Lynn and others have really presented this really great example of how we can use some of this marketing research to understand who uh, wants to participate in our studies, if, if a product became available, why would they want to use it or not. Um, and so we really are rethinking um, the way we do behavioral assessments and the rectal microbicide agenda right now to fill in some of these gaps of knowledge. Um, so that, again, we have a larger picture as we fill in the grid of products and formulations that um, Craig nicely summarized. Next slide, please. So um, within the rectal microbicide research and development agenda, we really have prioritized gel-based formulations. Um, that in some ways is not surprising, considering that lubricant is such an important part of um, sexual practices, rectal practices. Um, and though it, it is often noted by participants as the most preferred formulation, um, the current delivery of product gels within the network has had several challenges. And I'm just showing you part of it is that we haven't done a really good job of making it sexy. So. Um, 
the, the first picture, the picture A, that's actually a vaginal insert that we have just um, used in, in rectal products, and participants have said, this does not fit my anatomy. It does not seem to um, work as well as it would in the vaginal compartment. Um, and then column B is actually a rectal um, applicator that was used in a recent project called Project Gel. Next slide, please. So um, MTN026, here we go. We'll, let's go through some of the products. So um, as Craig mentioned, it's um, the first clinical trial to look at the safety and acceptability data of the pivoting gel. And on the behavioral side, we will be examining um, participants' acceptability of the gel. We will be uh, having both surveys and in-depth interviews with participants to think about um, now that you've used the product, what are, what are other design and delivery issues we should think about, um, including the applicator, for instance? Um, what was your experience like in the clinical trial? Are there things we could be doing better as, as a network? And then are there particular things that we should be thinking about to improve the trial itself? Next slide. MTNO37. Um, again, we'll be looking at different doses um, in a sequential way. And um, within the behavioral trial, we'll be looking at acceptability and tolerability. How comfortable were you using the different doses of the product? And again, really thinking about um, participant-centered suggestions for the product design and delivery, thinking about the experience itself, and then how to make it better. Next slide. And the reason why um, I keep thinking about design and delivery, um, and I harp on it so much, is that we have learned in the past that delivery matters. Um, so um, this is two, uh, two sets of analyses from Project Gel, which was a study of um, 95 young men who have sex with men and trans women, um, where we asked them to use both the vaginal applicator in stage 1B and then uh, a subsample of participants that reported high adherence were given the rectal uh, applicator with actual active product. And um, what you can see here is that, um, as should be expected, uh, participants preferred the rectal applicator more than the vaginal applicator, uh, in part because it was much more portable. Um, but when we looked at um, whether or not the applicator and this a satisfaction with the applicator and, and satisfaction of the gel with the applicator predicted future use if, if a rectal microbicide like the one they had tested became available, the answer was yes, it does matter. So across different levels of gel satisfaction, if people felt really um, discontent or dissatisfied by the applicator, they were much less likely to want to intend to use a gel in the future. So when we think about the rectal microbicide agenda on, on the behavioral argument, we also have to start thinking about design, portability, and modality. Next slide. And I think this is why I'm so excited for MTN 033 to start, because as Craig noticed, we'll be able to compare um, whether an applicator dose is similar or different, and to some extent, as a self-administration with a coital stimulation device. And so we'll be able to see users' experiences applying the gel um, in, in a way that simulates rectal anal sex. Um, we will be able to compare and contrast uh, their satisfaction with the product, their needs um, as part of a, a participant in the study, and then also get some of these um, suggestions moving forward. Next slide. But gel is, I think, only one, um, one side of the equation, and we have many different other types of modalities that are behaviorally congruent with different um, populations of MSM. We can think about enemas, we can think of suppositories um, and tablets, some that perhaps have more prevalence um, in use than others, but still might accommodate different um, formulations and may fit into different types of lives a little bit better than perhaps a gel with an applicator, if, if, if that were to be the the decision. And so um, we're really interested in starting to think about modality. Next slide. And modality actually is not just about formulation, it's about different cultures and societies um, and contexts. And so this is a, a great paper by Kinsler et al., where they actually found that depending on the region that they were sampling in South America um, and given different scenarios, some participants actually preferred some modalities better than others. And so again, helping think through context, product, and delivery vehicle. Next slide. So rectal douching um, is probably the most prevalent one. We know that men 
uh, often report douching before RAI for a series of reasons, as well as um, douching after RAI. Next slide. And um, we also um, know that there, there has been some data to suggest that a suppository or an insert might be uh, preferable, but the data there is actually much, much less. We, we know less about inserts and suppositories than we do about douching. And in fact, we found a um, 2008, Carballo, Diegas, and all found that um, MSM preferred a, a microbicide gel over a suppository. However, the suppository that was used in that study was eight times the size of the, the um, formulation we are planning for 035 and 039. Um, and so we need to look at, in a smaller dosage, would it be more acceptable um, and, and move the field forward there. Next slide. So in 039, we'll be looking at participants' acceptability of the rectal insert. We'll be thinking about suggestions on how to promote its use during a within a clinical trial, how to make those, um, those suggestions kind of enacted as we move that, that work forward and also other suggestions and experiences from the community. Next slide. And then I'll, um, I'll finish with 035. Um, so uh, 035 is uh, currently under development. It is a protocol that will um, systematically compare and contrast the acceptability, tolerability, and adherence of an insert, an enema, and a suppository in a sample of young men who have sex with men and trans people in five countries, and those five countries are Thailand, South Africa, Malawi, Peru, and the U.S. And our intent is to examine how participants use the three different products at different times and then um, understand what promotes different, um, different trajectories of use, how, how people actually use a product in the way that fits their lives. This is a placebo formulation, but the idea really is to go take a step back and think, if we have these, these three different modalities, what do we need to know before we insert an active product and, and start thinking of a phase two or a phase three trial? Next slide. And just, um, just so you can kind of think about um, what it looks like, there will be six different sequences where we will ask participants to use each formulation for four weeks with um, you know average washout period of a week or so. Um, and then we'll be able to compare and contrast these different um, sequences and formulation. Next slide. And our intent there is to really start flipping the script. So we know what traditional research requires us um, within the clinical trial framework to do, but we also need to be mindful of the community needs and, and the needs of having products that are really behaviorally congruent if they're going to have any traction in the future. And so we really are devoted in the behavioral working group to think about how do we understand participants' context better? How do we help um, the clinical trials think about products that are more desirable? Um, how do we start fostering that desire for our product? And then how do we make sure that it fits um, our way of life as, as different communities? Um, next slide. And so I encourage you to um, continue working with us on this the behavioral rectal microbicide agenda and um, helping us fill those gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, and sorry for the pause there. I, too, was having issues with my mute button. Uh, we have a couple of quick questions, and then we want to move uh, right over to, Ken's, to Ken Palmer. The first question, Jose, is since in 035 it sounds like the network will be um, including transgender men, why is it then that that study would not also include uh, women? since wouldn't it be the same physiological deal looking for rectal protection and rectal effects uh, or, you know, what happens with uh, this, these products in the bodies of people with vaginas? So can you speak to that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, that is a complex question, as you know, Jim. Um, so let me tell you the, the, the reasons. Um, reason one is that um, 
cost <laughs> and feasibility are, are a big concern. Um, scientifically, though, we are um, mindful of gender um, differences as well as um, just trying to make sure that um, we don't bite off more than we can chew. Um, and so I am hopeful that we will have a rectal microbicide uh, study for cis women very, very soon. But for now, um, as the vaginal microbicide agenda is moving forward, um, we want to make sure that we're also keeping pace with other vulnerable populations that might benefit from a microbicide formulation. Thank you, Jose. And one last question. For the participants in Malawi in the 035 study, will uh, that site be recruiting both transgender women and gay men? Um, yes, uh, sites are encouraged to recruit whomever they um, they find to be eligible and willing to um, adhere to the guidelines of the protocol. Thank you so much, Jose. It was an excellent presentation. Um, we are now going to turn the speaker phone over to Ken Palmer from the University of Louisville, who is going to be talking about um, some recent information regarding the development of griffithsin for rectal microbicides. Go ahead, Ken, and make sure to unmute your phone by pressing star seven. Hi, Jim, and hello, everybody on the call. Jim, I, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, um, for being on the call. It's my pleasure to update you all on our progress in developing Griffithson into a rectal microbicide through the PREVENT study, which is an NIH program-funded study. Um, I would like the next slide, please. I'm going to start off just reminding everybody, it's been a few years since I presented in this forum, uh, what Griffithson is. Uh, Griffithson is a potent plant-derived viral entry inhibitor, and as a rectal microbicide strategy, this is a non-antiretroviral-based um, strategy. The, the it's a protein, a small protein, that was first isolated from the red alga, a marine organism, Griffithia, it's a, a small protein with 121 in, uh, amino acids. It's a dimeric protein, and it has three high mannose binding sites per subunit. It works against HIV um, because it, and, and other viruses like herpes and, and hepatitis C because uh, Griffithson has very high affinity to sugars on the surface of those viruses, and those viruses are very heavily um, decorated with sugars or, or glycans. Um, it has very potent entry inhibitor activity against HIV in the low uh, picomolar to low nanomolar range. And uh, our study is supported, as I said, by uh, the NIAID for a first in human clinical trial as a topical microbicide to prevent HIV transmission. And we, we call this study the PREVENT study. Next slide, please. So um, I, I've given you a little background into why we are working with Griffithson. Um, in updating where we are now and in comparison to where we were a couple of years ago, I, I want to let everybody know that we've done some improvements of Griffithson um, to address a, a particular concern that might have impacted its clinical development and have developed a new improved composition, which is called Q Griffithson. And so our program is now the Q GRFT Prevent Study. I'll give you a little introduction into the pipeline of Q Griffithson products and give some new and updated information about the Q Griffithson product safety and efficacy pro profile and give you an overview of our planned Prevent clinical study. Next slide, please. So we discovered fairly on in the development program for the Griffithson products that uh, Griffithson uh, could be oxidized that, that under uh, oxidative stress conditions, such as an environment you might find, it, particularly in the vagina. But the, uh, so we were aware that the FDA might have concerns about the product being susceptible to oxidation, 
And so we decided to develop an oxidation resistant form of Griffithson that maintained the product stability and activity to develop as an HIV microbicide. The way we used we um, addressed this was a structure-guided approach. We, we know the molecular structure of Griffithson, um, and we generated amino acid variants of the parent active pharmaceutical ingredient, and we looked at each of them for uh, product manufacturability, activity, stability to oxidation, and compatibility with the gel-based formulation that we were targeting. We found several different variants at one amino acid position in the, in the protein, it was position 78, and selected M78Q as the lead drug substance. And I'll show you in the next slide that the product is uh, much improved in, in terms of its uh, oxidation susceptibility. In this graph, you see the product going from 100% unoxidized product to 0% oxid uh, unoxidized product, so 100% oxidized product, over time when it was exposed to hydrogen peroxide. And the, the original Griffithson composition is represented in the black line, where you see it rapidly goes from nearly 100% um, unoxidized to fully oxidized over a 24-hour period. In the same condi conditions where we expose the Q Griffithson to hydrogen peroxide, uh, the product uh, was very resistant to oxidation, and, and uh, we believe that this made it highly suitable for taking forward into the clinic. On the next slide, uh, I'll, we show that we verified that the, this new Q Griffithson product um, has equivalent activity against HIV pseudoviruses on the left and against uh, HIV, live HIV virus on the right uh, with IC50 values of e equivalent levels um, indicating equivalent potency between the new uh, version of, of Griffithson and the wild type Griffithson. So um, this gave us additional satisfaction that we we're working on the right molecule. And may I have the next slide, please? We have gone forward, and Lisa Rowan's group at the University of Pittsburgh has developed our lead product, which is a, a rectal gel for pericoital use, on-demand use. It's a, a, a carbopole-based gel, and we have been testing this extensively in preclinical studies in both rats and in uh, monkeys. Uh, Dr. Rowan's group has also developed some alternative dosage forms. We're looking forward uh, and looking at c consumer preferences. Uh, she has also developed a prototype, prototype of rectal film, as well as fat-based and water-based suppositories. So we hear the message that, that Jose and, and Craig were both putting forward about the need for um, behaviorally congruent products, as well as, as, as giving um, uh, people the, the, the choice of which uh, delivery system they wanted to use. And, and although we're taking the gel into our first in humans clinical trial, uh, we do have a pipeline of alternative uh, formulation dosage forms. On next slide, please. We've performed um, safety studies of the Q Griffithson gel product, and, and this just is a busy slide with, with lots of data that people can peruse at their leisure. But the bottom line is that we performed a seven day rectal irritation study in rats where we compared with the, the placebo gel with our clinical target dose gel, which is a 0.3% weight per volume. Um, uh, uh, concentration gel, and uh, 10 times higher to test the uh, toxicity with the 3% gel. We com compared the performance of the placebo gel and the um, active product gel with Conceptrol, which is an anoxinol-based, mine-based um, contraceptive product, and benzocholium chloride, which would generate even more of a safety signal for a positive control. 
And, and what we found was in both male and female animals, uh, the um, toxicity, the acceptability of, of the um, Griffithson product gel, the Q-Griffithson product gels were, were really quite perfect um, in comparison with positive controls. I have the next slide, please. We also evaluated um, in, with a contract research organization, Inquest Lab, uh, the effect of the Q-Griffithson product on both beneficial microflora, which would include Lactobacillus species, and selected SPI pathogens. We were interested in, in learning whether the multipurpose um, application of Griffithson would extend beyond HSV and HCV and HIV. Um, and looked at gonorrhea and chlamydia, and we found that the Q-Griffin product has no antibacterial activity, so it, it does have no um, negative impact on, on friendly bacteria, and also does not have uh, activity against uh, other SPI bacterial pathogens. That's useful information. The next slide, please. We performed a, a pharmacological um, experiment in non-human primates to determine the pharmacokinetics of the 0.3% um, uh, clinical product. Uh, these animals, six female non-human primates, were rectally dosed with the 0.3% Q-Griffin gel, and we collected rectal eluates at 15 minutes, 30 minutes, two hours, six hours and 24 hours after application. And the data that are presented there in, in three different forms, one is a dot plot that represents the, the different animals in each cohort, um, and the other is a, is a line graph that shows each, what the concentration of Q-Griffin was in the rectal eluates from each of the animals, and, and the third graph shows a composite. And what we see is that the concentration of Griffithson, Q Griffithson released from the gel is stable between 15 minutes and two hours after application, which is good news because it shows prolonged um, concentrations of, of uh, active product. The um, concentration of the Q Griffithson product begins to decrease by six hours, but we do note that at six hours, the concentration of q present in the rectal eluates was greater than the IC90 for even the most resistant, uh, Griffithson resistant HIV um, types that we tested. So uh, we, we are very encouraged by the pharmacokinetic profile that we are observing of the 0.3% q product. And um, are moving forward now in the monkeys with the, an efficacy study. Next slide, please. So to summarize what we know and where we're going, um, we, we have a Q-Griffin product now that is more resistant to oxidation than the wild type and is compatible with our gel formulation. We selected the Q-Griffin product for the clinical study. Um, it's a 0.3% carbopole-based gel. Preliminary results of pharmacokinetics, bioavailability, and safety in rats and non-human primates look excellent. We are, have already started the good laboratory practice toxicology work, which will be what we need to do to submit the IND application to the FDA. Uh, the, the study is a 21-day daily rectal exposure with 14-day recovery in rats and rabbits. And the phase one clinical study is scheduled to begin by the beginning of 2019. Next slide, please. Here I will just provide an, an overview of the phase one clinical study. Uh, this will be performed at the University of Pittsburgh where Ian McGowan and Ross Cranston will be overseeing the study. It's a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover study which has 18 participants and enrollment is open to both healthy men and women who have experience with um, anal sex. The um, administration of Griffithson will be performed as directly observed therapy in the clinic, 
and we're collecting multiple safety endpoints, including um, ex vivo, ex plant challenge, as, as Dr. Hendricks had, had uh, alluded to before. Uh, the, the study is a, is a slightly unusual study because one of the things that we're looking at understanding is whether the product has any um, effect on, on the local rectal immune system. And um, so at, it, it, what we're doing in the first stage is doing a, an open label study with three volunteers who, who will receive a single uh, exposure. The, Safety data will then be reviewed at, before we open stage two, where we will um, enroll another 15 people to, for the total of 18. The, those people will have seven daily Q Griffiths and gel exposures. And then we'll pause the study to allow any potential immune response to develop and then evaluate uh, at the seven daily uh, exposures again in the same group of, of volunteers. So uh, I think that comes to the end of my presentation. If you, on the next slide, I have uh, provided a, a list, a partial list of, of acknowledgments. Uh, the PREVENT study is a large collaboration between many different people, and I'm grateful for everybody's participation in the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, uh, third in all great presentations this morning or afternoon or evening, depending. Thank you folks for sticking around for just a few more minutes. We are at the top of the hour, but we have a few questions we'd like to take, and if we can squeeze in one verbally, we'll do that. But I'm going to quickly go through these uh, chat questions, and if all of our uh, presenters can unmute their phones and be ready to answer any of these quickly, that would be great. The first question is, what is the researcher's opinion on the role of a nanocarrier-based microbicide on efficacy and adherence? Have there been any studies related to nanomicrobicides planned, or are there any in the near future? Would anyone like to take that question quickly? Well, this is Craig. I can try. Um, so I think there's, there are some nano – one way to look at some of the injectables is as nanocarriers. What I would say is if there's a nanocarrier – of an anti active antiretroviral that has um, superior drug concentration time uh, properties, that is, it achieves concentrations uh, that are, we believe to be protective very rapidly within, say, 15 or 30 minutes, and if it sustains those for a day or days, uh, three, to, three to seven days as one target, then that's the sort of thing that would be very interesting to consider amongst other existing options to take forward. There, there's, you know, I don't know that the nano per se, if the nano gets beyond a, a problem with the current dosing form, then I think we'd be very interested. Uh, but the nano per se isn't necessarily um, sort of the best approach for this particular problem because there's our, you know, we, in our dream program, for, for example, we are looking at uh, different nano formulations of tenofovir but honestly, the tenofovir that we're looking at in just a very simple enema, just dissolved in saline or half normal saline, achieves very high concentrations. We're still trying to figure out exactly how long it lasts, um, just because we haven't looked at that those samples yet. Um, so it's a it's it's fair game. It may be the solution to the problem, and it's uh, I think it's important to see if there's something that's superior to what we've already studied. So, you know, we potentially would be very open to that sort of an approach. There are none that I'm aware of, other than I mean, I'm aware we're doing these uh, nano formulations of tenofovir in mice and macaques, and if they look good, then our interest is to take those forward to a clinical program. So that's about as much as I know about nano carriers as topical microbicides to date. Thanks. And Craig, this one might be good for you too. What is your opinion on a long-acting rectal microbicide? Well, so so I think some of the things I just mentioned were would be my my sort of um, um, wish list for what I would consider long-acting. You know, if there was a way to um, every, you know long-acting to for an on-demand product may, is long enough to be good for on-demand, but doesn't necessarily provide protection for weeks. So I think it kind of depends on what you mean by that. If you mean a single topical dose that uh, that maintains protective concentrations for weeks, 
um, or longer, uh, that would be terrific. Um, but I think uh, that it would be in interesting to see what sort of formulation would be able to sustain that over time. The long-acting injectables, their advantage is that you give an injection and then for two months you're, you have hopefully protective levels, say with cabotegravir, which is in, currently in phase three studies, but you have systemic exposures. So the, how, the question is how would you have a technology that could apply topically and achieve very high concentrations? And the challenge is that, you know, especially in the GI tract, first of all, you've got you know, bowel movements that clear anything that's in the lumen. That's actually a very effective clearance mechanism, so that would limit anything to probably days in the lumen. And then if you have something that gets into tissue, the tissue is turning over fairly rapidly. That's the nature of the tissue because it's, it's exposed to these sorts of stresses of um, um, you know, bowel movements and, and stool and sort of doing what the GI tract does. Uh, and, and those tissues naturally turn over very rapidly, at least the epithelial tissues do. And immune cells, which is what you're actually trying to target, those cells are trafficking into and out of rectal tissue so when it traffics in, that's good. You put drug in it from a rectal application. But then if those cells, once they're loaded with drug, they traffic back out and circulate through lymph nodes or through systemic circulation, they're leaving with the drug. So it, there's a lot of challenges. But you know, if, if it provides a profile that, that lasts for, say, a week or perhaps even weeks, those are very interesting if there's a technology to do that. But it's but long acting in the sense of systemic long acting and that time scale has additional challenges that systemic long acting doesn't have. It also has advantages, obviously, in terms of expo systemic exposures, uh, which you get with injectables and implantables, but you don't have with topicals. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. We have a few more questions. So I'm going to ask you guys to answer them as quickly as you possibly can so we can um, get folks on their way uh, on their days and evenings. Uh, this is for Jose. Uh, do you think we need a new, better design for a rectal applicator? Yes. How's that for quick? <laughs> yes, I think, I think we, should, we should revisit if gel will be the, one of the, the vehicles that we want to move forward. I think we should revisit how, um, how we can create an applicator that is sexier and that, um, and how we'll teach men and women to to use that applicator, um, because right now, and we don't use an applicator for lubricant. So, um, yes. Thank you very much, Jose. Kenneth, I think this is for you. Um, if there will ever be a Graffiston product, how expensive do you think it would be to produce? Maybe looking at it in comparison to similar TAF-based products. Do you have any sense of cost, Kenneth? That's very difficult for me to, to uh, commit to, Jim. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that we are extremely aware of, of, the, of the need to keep the cost as low as practical. And uh, we're, this is one of the reasons why we use a plant-based system to manufacture the product. And uh, the... We, we are, are doing ongoing performance enhancement, uh, uh, manufacturing enhancements, and uh, our, our um, focus is definitely on, on reducing costs. We're, we're really not here to do research that is just for the sake of research. We want a product that will uh, be practically applied in, in people if, if it looks like it's safe and effective. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, this could be for any of you guys. Again, short and sweet. Um, which formulation prototype do you think is better regarding microbicide delivery, a fat type suppository or a hydrophilic base type suppository? Do we know? We don't know because we haven't compared those. I think uh, both could work. I, the, the sort of my immediate concern about a fat based suppository would be that it doesn't have some, there's not something negative with either the rectal mucosa or the, um, or a condom, for example. Uh, those are certainly for each individual may have a varying uh, degree of concern depending on whether or not condoms are used. Um, but I think that would have to be tested directly. Uh, we've, we've actually studied rectal microbicides, uh, not a suppository, but there was a lipid-based fluid and a lipid-based semi-solid gel that was studied. and. Uh, one of those lipid-based products 
actually enhanced HIV infection in our explant assays, whereas an aqueous uh, gel uh, reduced without an active ingredient. The ac an aqueous gel or liquid, I actually forget which, um, reduced HIV transmission and provided protection itself, I think it was the gel. Uh, so we'd have to do those studies. If there was a formulation that was just, you know, not universally, but had a high degree of acceptability, it would be great as long as it was shown to be safe in terms of the rectal mucosa and not enhancing in terms of HIV infection. Thank you. And finally, I'm going to end with a, a great kind of mixed uh, commentary and question from Anna Forbes. I'm just going to read it directly from Anna. It would seem to me that if a product is not behaviorally congruent, we run the risk that people will use the microbicide in addition to a lube or douche. Couldn't this have a dramatic effect on the microbicide's effectiveness? I'm imagining someone using a microbicidal film, for example, and then applying a lubricant that reduces the film's effectiveness. So congruency is not just a matter of acceptability, but also a matter of not negating the microbicide's effectiveness, right? To Anna, I would say right. <laughs> and one of the important elements of uh, some of these studies, I can say in the DREAM program for sure, DREAM02 is going to be looking at the impact of a series of enemas, some of which are medicated, some are not. I think for, for every one of these, it's important to understand uh, the impact of sex on the product and the addition of seminal fluid, for example. Uh, this has been demonstrated to have a significant impact in vaginal studies, and I think we should look at sequencing of different products for their compatibility uh, within the larger behavioral context. So Anna is right on the mark with that. I think that as products are developed, once we know that it sort of does what we want it to do in terms of staying there long enough, being effective to prevent in local infection, um, then also to be sure that it's compatible with other, with other um, products that might be used in sort of the pericoital setting. And then just to piggyback on, on that, um, for MTN035, that's exactly, Anna, one of the things we're aiming to do is we want uh, participants to use the placebo products alongside any other practices they do just so that we can start getting a better understanding of what is the complete behavioral formula um, as we design new products. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, all of you who have been on the call today. Thanks to AVAC for supporting us and Levi at AVAC especially for handling all the logistics so beautifully. The presentations are currently available on Irma's website and the teleconference page. Soon we will also be posting a recording and a video, a kind of a flash video of the slides and recording mix. Those will also be there. You will be getting these links through your email um, soon. You'll be getting a follow-up email. So thank you for all of that. If you have questions, please follow up with us. And please, as we have noted many times in emails about these teleconferences and in the chat today, please be sure to click on that NIH link about refining the research enterprise and provide your comments about the need for um, products like microbicides. We, the NIH needs to hear from everybody, not just researchers. Um, they need to hear from advocates and folks in the community um, around their desire and requests for a variety of options to prevent HIV. And with that said, I will say thank you once again. Have a great afternoon and evening or morning. And if you're in various parts of the U.S., um, don't look at the sun um, about noon because we are going into an eclipse. Thanks all. Take care. Bye-bye.